Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yes. Our two uh, town tech, guy, tech guys are not here today. So Dan and I are double duty and back and forth. So let's have a quick word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for your presence. We just invite you to come and fill our hearts and spirits as only you can, Lord. Just bless this time, Lord, and pour and pour. Pour into us all you have for us. Lord, we know that there's a lot of families traveling and activities this weekend with graduation. Lord, we just pray blessing be upon all of them and keep them all safe. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Whew. I don't know about you, this is, this is kind of the most busiest week I've had in a while. We had... Uh, Graduation, a memorial service, and two, uh, two graduation parties, and had to meet some people for breakfast all yesterday. So and then we have church in the morning, we have potluck, and then right after this we're going to another graduation, our grandson's graduation party. So uh, this, uh, and then our two sound guys aren't here. And so Dan and I are having to do this, and then the memorial service, I was doing the sound guy stuff with that, and it, and it was, uh, that's a whole other story, so. <laughs> but praise the Lord, God's good. Yes. Amen, I'm uh, looking for the day that when we do graduate, we graduate to Amen. be with the Lord. Yes. And we fulfilled our purpose and destiny here, and we're with Him, so praise the Lord. Last week, because of uh, the prayer request that we had to pray for that tragedy, uh, and it, it prompted me to go down a whole another road, which is, was a, leading with passion. I've been talking about the last few weeks about passion. We do what we do out of passion. If we're doing things out of just responsibility, obligation, or because it's the law or this, there's no passion in it. But when you are motivated by passion for a relationship, a marriage relationship, your parents are passionate about their children to keep them safe and help them become the best that they can be in life, it's a whole different ballgame because I'm not necessarily passionate about your kids like I'm passionate about mine. Uh, and so passion is, is a driving force, should be a driving force in a relationship with God. And it, my heart that I, I'm, I try to present to us is that the distinction that the, the, the church has got caught up in is religion. And we do a religious thing. We go to church on Sunday. We might go on Wednesday. But we've done a religious thing and the rest of the week is mine. And that's, that's religion. But a relationship, that would be like I go to work, I do my thing, I go out and I play my games, I play golf, I do all the things that I want to do, but when I come home, my wife better have a dinner on the table and be ready to meet all my needs. What kind of a passionate relationship is that? It's not. But how many relationships we have, we see that are like that? Passion should be what every one of us is willing to drive into whatever God calls us to do and be a part of with, the, with our, all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. Amen. And so last week, this was my notes from last week. I didn't do that last week. And so I want to um, go through this because it's how do we develop a greater passion for Jesus and shift from a religious mindset, an obligation mindset, like I, I got to do this to be saved. Is that why we do it? Because last week that I shared with you, you can go back, it's on, on a video, 
the passion that I have for Jesus is what I have experienced when my sister lost her son. And I, that's a whole story that's last week that I shared. And she was dying and God took her to heaven to, to say goodbye to her son. That's a God who loves us. Amen. A God who cares about us. And not everybody will have those kind of relationships. I haven't had those kind of relationships. But I see how God works. And I know that's who God is. And I want, I want that passion in my life. I want that passion in our church. I want that passion in each one of us. Because we're doing it out, not of obligation or responsibility or this is what I have to do to be saved. I don't want to burn in hell. That's not even a part of my, I'm not even worried about hell. Because my, my responsibility is to him. The same as my responsibility is towards my wife. I love her. And, and it's, it's out of that. So just some quick things that we, uh, uh, we talked about a few weeks ago. And these are, you can go back and watch these, these, uh, the videos of this. Where is your passion? Uh, passion leads us to compassion. And this all triggered with me was, was the, uh, uh, the uh, oh, what was he? <laughs> the what? The, the guy on the side of the road. Yeah, the guy on the side of the road. The Good Samaritan, yeah. The Good Samaritan. This all started with the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan felt compassion. Where did that compassion come from? It comes from passion. To see someone in need. That we should be motivated into compassion because we're passionate. And I, I said this, is, is why did the churches in the South not stand up with passion and compassion for the slave trade? As William Wilberforce did in England to bring down the slave trade. It was the passion of his life that he had compassion. He was willing to step out and risk his whole life. And right after the final ruling, they overruled it. Three days later, he died. He went to heaven. That was his life's purpose. Was motivated by compassion to, to stop the slave trade. Why is it we, in our culture, we see these things happening, but we're not moved by compassion to change them? And so, and then, uh, then we talked about, the, next week we talked about the five things that destroy our passion. An unscriptural attitude like a religious attitude. We can have all the religion, the, the, the word down, but we have it so locked in is that we're, we're motivated by legalism, law. Uh, unconfessed sins. We're living in sin. We're living, well, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, so I can go out and live the way I want. I can do what I want. I'm going to heaven. It doesn't work that way. We need to confess our sins that daily and keep our heart right because unconfessed sins will break down that compassion, uh, passion relationship that we have with the Lord. Undisciplined lifestyle, living just for the world, for the moment, for the pleasure, and un, unnourished spirit, if I'm not nourishing my spirit. Unresolved conflicts, conflicts and relationships, not dealing with them. The biggest thing I want to say on this is the amount of unforgiveness that is in the church, that's in the world. You did that to me, and I'm not going to forgive you for it. Well, Tom can just go on and live his life and don't know that I have an attitude towards him. But who, does it destroy him? No, it destroys me. Because I have not released it. Forgiveness is not about justification. Forgiveness, when I forgive someone, doesn't mean I justify their actions. But what I'm doing when I forgive them, when Jesus on the cross, he didn't justify their action and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He was releasing himself from that, that what was taking place. When I forgive, when you forgive, we release it. So we do not let our past destroy our future. So we can walk forward 
with a full heart and I can come back into relationship, I can talk with people and stuff, and I'm not, there's no barrier, there's no bitterness, there's, because I released it, I let it go. That's what forgiveness is. And so you can see that one later. But the, today I want to get into is how do we get passion for Jesus? How do, how do we cha- achieve this passion for the Lord? Number one, we have to fall in love with Jesus. We have to fall in love with our Lord. That we, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love him for what he's done for me. I love him because of he has, is intimate with me and I have a relationship with him. Passion for Jesus is seeing his beauty, seeing what he has accomplished for us. It allows our hearts to warm to the truth of what Jesus did on the cross to show his love for us. Falling in love with Jesus means that you treasure him above all things. Amen. All things. All relationships on this earth. Everything that we do on this earth, Jesus is number one. Because if he's number one in my life, then he will flow through me into all those other things that I do in life. Having a passion for Jesus changes you. It changes you from the inside out. Religion changes us from the outside in. You can look and you can sound and you can be religious. But in Jesus said to the Pharisees, you're, you're white and sepulchers full of dead men's bones. You're dead inside. Because it's not inside. Paul described his sold out passion for Jesus like this. In uh, Philippians. I, I indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing wealth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. If if you have uh, YouTube, go on YouTube and look up an ex-Mormon, Micaiah Wilder. He's a, Micah, yeah, M-I-C-A-H. Tremendous testimony. He went on his two-year, he was a Mormon, he went on a two-year, his two-year mission to Florida, and he was so on fire, he was going to save the world. He went, he went into a Baptist church, I'm going to save this, get this Baptist converted, I'm going to convert the whole church. So he sat down and he talked with this Baptist pastor. And this Baptist pastor talked with him and laid out the scripture and all this kind of stuff, and and. The last thing he said to him, he says, Micaiah, go and read read the Bible, the New Testament, as a child. Just read through it. So he left. And he did. He fell in love with Jesus. He found everything that he'd been looking for that he could not find in the religion. In Jesus. He, towards the end of their two years, they have to give up and give a testimony. And he was scared to death and he got up and shared his testimony that he found Jesus. So they cut off his two years and sent him home. And he was paral- paralyzed going home. His mom was a professor in ORU. His dad was a high priest in the, what? Huh? BYU, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. My wife is back. You're going. <laughs> That's why I need you guys. This is a team effort here. His dad was a high priest. His, he had sib, uh, brothers and sister and stuff. And go home and he's going to lose, lose everything. And he, he comes home and... And he just began to, to share with them what he experienced, the love of Jesus and stuff. And his whole family got saved. Hallelujah. His whole family got saved. Yeah. 
but he risked everything for Jesus. And he told his, Jesus, his, his family to read the New Testament as a child. And they found Jesus in it. So the last video I just watched, years later, he, call, he found this, this pastor, this Baptist pastor, and he called him. He's not pastoring now, but he called him and he told him. And the pastor said, I thought that I, it, the whole thing blew up. I thought it would, it would be nothing. He said, I want you to know what you did. I got saved. And my whole family has got saved. That's what it's about. He found the passionate love of Jesus Christ. And he was willing to risk it all for that relationship that he had in the Lord. Talking to God, number two. Every day, take time to talk to God. Be sure to confess your sins and ask for his forgiveness. Pray for the needs in your life and others. Thank him for all the ways that he helps you every day. He's, he's doing things in your life when you don't even know it. He's positioning things that are going to happen in your life and you're not even aware of it. All of a sudden, you run across somebody you haven't seen in years. What, well, how did that happen? Because God has appointed these things to happen in your life. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord at all times. Living in an attitude of praise. Even when things are the darkest and the most confusing and you don't know what to do. Lord, I just worship you. Lord, I know you will be with me in this. Help me walk through this situation. I just praise you, Lord. You said you would never leave me nor forsake me. Number three. Serve him with your whole being. As Christians, we're called to worship God with every part of our being. Jesus knows we're prone to wander. So it's, he's not shocked when we tend to wander away on things. But he's right there, always there trying to bring us back on track. And we also lose focus at times. Things happen. Things will go through through time. We'll lose our focus. And then we have to set back and get, okay, get our priorities right. Get our focus back on. The world lures us away. And our hearts can grow cold and complacent. We have an adversary that does not want us to be passionately in love with Jesus. And he will do everything in his power, his power, to cause you to wander away. Jesus in, <clears throat> encouraged his, father, his followers how to avoid this complacency. In Matthew, <clears throat> and he said to, to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Psalms 119, with your whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Paul, uh, John, uh, David saying that. Psalms 138, I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods I will sing praises to you. In the midst of the gods of this world we will sing praises to the Most High God. We will exalt him. And when things look the darkest in this world, we will exalt the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. And we will do warfare by worshiping. We will worship. No matter how dark this world gets, we're going to worship. Worship with all our heart, with all our soul. Number four, devour the Bible. You grow in passion for Christ as you read and study the scripture. 
You spend time in God's word every day. Reading scriptures is like drinking cold water. Drinking that freshness of the Holy Spirit coming into you. In 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. We need the word. We need the word not just in tablets, but we need the word in our heart right here. And as you read the word, you may not think that, I just can't remember all this stuff. And all of a sudden you'll be in a situation and all a scripture will pop into your head. Where did that come from? Because it's, it's, it's a part of your spirit. It's your spirit man inside of you. Not, not your brain. We're dealing with the spirit. And so it's feeding our spirit. So sometimes we don't understand what things are going on because of our, we get our brain involved, but it's our heart. The, heart. the word of God goes into our heart. It becomes a part of our heart, our being inside. Number five, spend time with other believers. We have to spend time in fellowship. <clears throat> spend time with other believers who are passionate about Jesus. You want to get negative, be around negative Christians. We need to be around those that are following the Lord with their heart and their soul. Not because just someone says, I, I am a Christian. The sad, sad depart, thing to say is, I don't remember exactly the percentage of those people who go to church on Sunday who actually believe the word of God and what Jesus did for them. And come before the Lord and confess their sins and receive his salvation. Because there's a lot of people who have been raised in church, they go to church. Yeah, I, I believe in Jesus. Well, just believing in Jesus gets you to heaven. Well, the scripture tells us the devil believes. So just believing in Jesus will not get you to heaven. So what it, what it is, it's... It's coming into your heart and confessing your sins because he died on the cross for you. I accept, Jesus, your sal salvation that you purchased for me, that I put all my sins upon you that you put on the cross for me. Lord, I receive the sacrifice you made for me. Wash me of all of my sins. Amen. That's repentance. Repentance is turning from your sin. There's so many people out there just, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But the question that I, I'm coming to, I need to ask people, have you accepted your salvation of repentance? We need to know, not just that you believe, but do you know Jesus and the sacrifice he made for your sins and have you repented of your sins? That's salvation. When you do that, you just put your sins upon the cross. Until that point, we, are, we, just, we just believe like everybody else believes. Yeah, I believe there's a God. I believe. And we've lukewarmed it down so much that some of the churches now that are, are saying, well, you can live the way you want. You can be whatever gender you want. You can do whatever. And we're not going to condemn you because God is love. And so we love everybody. But I'm a, I love you so much, I'm going to tell you the truth. Amen. I'm not going to lie to you. Because the enemy wants us to lie to people and say, all you got to do is believe, and we accept you in your sin. And it's like I've, I've said, I, I want people who are in sin to come to church. But I'm going to... I'm not going to compromise the message, and I don't want you to compromise the message of salvation because we just want people to come to church. If you're living in an a adulterous relationship, you need to get out of it. Amen. If you're feeling like you're in the wrong body, 
That's the devil lying to you. You need to confess that sin before Jesus. It's the truth because we love. And we spend time with the Lord. And we build passion, a passionate relationship with him. And so passionate, I do not want to deceive anyone and keep anyone from hell. But so much of the world, the church in, in, our, in America is compromising because we're afraid we might lose people. I would, I'm more afraid of losing people to hell Amen. than standing before the Lord Jesus one day and giving account. And the Lord says, Dan, how come you didn't speak the truth? You had these people that sat in the congregation and I wanted them. But you didn't speak the truth. You said a compromising message, and I'm holding you accountable for it. That's what weighs heavy on my heart, is to speak the truth. You will become like the people you associate with. Birds of a feather flock together. You become those people you associate with. Doesn't mean I don't associate with people in the world. But my true association is with the body of Christ. That's where I draw strength from. That's where I draw encouragement from. And love and relationship. And we grow together as the body of Christ. That I can be strong and go out into the world. Go out into the workplace. Go out into the different areas of life. And, and love those people. But I will not conform to them. I want to be a light in the midst of darkness. I want them to come to me and say, Dan, how come you're so different? And then that gives me opportunity because Jesus loves me and he lives in my heart. Being around passionate believers inspires and encourages you in our faith. Especially as times get darker in the world and stuff, we need each other. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, especially as you see that day approaching. That's why we were only shut down for just a very few weeks with the COVID. I said, no, this is wrong. Scripture tells me I've got to be in church. I've got to be here. And you can come, you don't have to come, but we, we started church again. And they're not going to shut us down again. Amen. Observing others. Watching other people as they walk with the Lord. There's people that I have admired in their walk with faith and their encouragement. Some of you, I am encouraged by watching you. And that encouragement helps me as we watch each other and we encourage as we walk forward. Hebrews 10, uh, 25, I just quoted this. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as we see that day approaching. Number six, obey God's word. Today, asking someone to obey the law is considered a, as hindering their rights. Many uh, parents don't require their kids to obey. The police are often seen as too authoritative and few CEOs even ask their employees to follow the rules. So what are we living in today as a lawless society? There's no accountability for anything. Whatever you want to do, do. And the uh, referendum there, I need to get with, with Jerry, initiative referendum, there is parental rights that if your kid goes to school, it was in the state of Washington, goes to school and, and the kid tells the, the teacher they want to be another gender, the state can take your child away from you and not tell you. And they can do whatever they want with you. How evil is the day that we're living in? How evil it is, the stuff that they're wanting to do to children. Uh, which one was I on? I'm um, on six? Oh, okay. We're on six, okay. Uh, 
the scripture here, Luke eleven twenty-eight. 28. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Uh, that's John. Uh, but he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word and keep it. Luke 11. Passionate people have an ever-increasing desire to obey scripture. I want to obey God's word. It's a desire into me. It should be a desire in all of us. But he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Not just hearing it, but keep it. So why is he telling us this? Because he wants to put us under bondage? It's kind of like you're going out into a field and there's a sign there that says, don't touch the fence. Well, I can touch that fence if I want to. <laughs> I know some of my buddies growing up that did something else on the fence. The word is a sign that keeps you out of danger. Passionate people have an ever-increasing desire to obey the scripture. What they want to obey, not because it's a command, but because it's a love relationship with Jesus. I love his commands. I love what my Lord wants me to do. And the, the barriers that he puts in my life is to keep me out of danger. To keep me from falling away. Number seven, having a passion for lost souls. When you become a Christian, your heart changes and you want to share. Like uh, Micaiah, I guess it's, if I'm saying it right. Micah, okay, Micah. M-I-C-G-A-H, Micah, okay. Risked it telling the truth. Because he could have stood up and, and gave the, the normal conversation. A testimony of that faith. And go on with his life. Why did he risk it? Because he fell passionately in love with Jesus that he felt a love that he never experienced before. He felt a fullness that the religion never gave him. And so, passionately falling in relationship with someone. Why did I ask Shirley to marry me? Because I felt passionately in love with her. Hopefully that's why you get married. It's because you fall passionately in love with each other. We are married to Jesus. The teaching I did several months ago about the ancient Jewish wedding ceremony and where we are in the sequence of that ceremony that he's gone to prepare a place for us, and he's soon coming back to take us to where he is, we will be also. It's a love relationship. And so the virgins had to keep themselves ready in their wedding garments, their lamps lit, waiting for him to come back. They weren't out scurrying around, living in the world, and just being whatever, well, I know he's coming back. No, they were waiting because every night they were, had their lamps lit all night because they, he could come any time. And so as Christians, as believers, well, I'll just I'll go do this for a while, step away from the church for a while, step away from God for a while, and I'll go do my thing, and then I'll come back. But I know he's going to save me. He saved me, so I'm going to go to heaven. What kind of relationship is that with the Lord? It's like you're, you propose to someone, you're in the, the preparing for the wedding, but you're off having another relationship with somebody else on the same time. 
that's what a lot of the world is doing in this relationship with our Lord Jesus, our husband. Waiting for him to come back and receive him to himself. So that means that every day we have our, the, the fire of the lamp lit in our hearts for him. In Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man came not to serve, but, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Romans 10.1, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer is, that, is to God for them, is that they may be saved. It costs us a relationship with the world to have a relationship with the Lord. That's the decision each one of us must make. Must make. Is the world more important or is my Lord more important? Number eight, having a passionate worship and prayer life. Coming to a place where you're, you're worshiping and you're loving on the Lord Jesus Christ, loving him for what he does. So when we come together in times of worship, and what the Lord has showed us is this time of receiving the word is preparing our hearts so when we enter into worship, we will enter into the, with the word that's been placed in our heart, coming into a full relationship, a love relationship with him. It's not just a matter of singing a couple songs and, and oh, ain't that cool? No, it's, a, it's love language. Worshiping the Lord is a love language of worship. I worship you, almighty God, there is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace, that is what I long to do. Give you praise, for you are my righteousness. I worship you, O mighty God, there is none like you. Thank you, Jesus. That's our love language. I miss some of the old songs. that takes us to that place. Simple love language songs. That place, Lord, I love you with all my heart, all my soul. Isaiah 25, 1 says, The Lord, you are my God, and I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. Your life was planned a long time ago. Before the creation of the world, God knew you would live right now. And you would be the person you are right now. You would go through the things you, you, you're going through. You've gone through and are going to go through. He knows. He knows you. Psalms 45.3 Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Nine, the last one. Should we follow our God-given passions? Example of the faith-filled people who follow God is they fervently de desire to obey God and honor him. These are examples. Number one, Noah. Noah obeyed God, command, commanded to build an ark when the whole world was against him. And he just didn't build this ark overnight. And the mockery that they, he had to receive for years and years and years because it had never rained on the earth. But he was willing to do against all of the opposition to do what God told him to do. Abraham called out. 
called out. And now he's, by faith, Abraham obeyed when God called him to set out for a place that he was to receive and inherit. And, and he set out not knowing where he was going. It's like Micah stepping out in faith not knowing what was going to happen in the future. But he laid it on the line. Abraham laid it on the line. Moses, he led Israel out of Egypt into a promised land. They didn't know, they didn't have a map, say, well, you go to this point over here. He just said, God said, go this way, and he goes this way. Come to the Red Sea. Now what do we do? The army's coming behind us. We're going to be annihilated. What do we, what do, we do now? Had anybody ever seen the water split before? There's no reference there of that ever, ever, ever happened. But he takes, God says, take your staff, and he touched it in the water, and the water split. And then they went through on dry ground. That is a miracle. You just pull the water back, there's going to be mud. And those their carts, and every, their, they were probably been knee-deep of mud, but they went through on dry ground. And Pharaoh was so arrogant that he thought his God did this. And so he sent his army in. Well, what happened? The horse and rider fall into the sea. Fall into the sea. I don't know if you've seen any of the documentaries where they found, they crossed, and they found chariot wheels, found shields, they found all of the, where they had crossed through. It's, it's, God is good. Paul gave up his prestigious life as a rabbi to follow Christ. There's a book I, I've read, a couple of his books now, Zeb Pratt. He was from the tribe of Aaron. He was a businessman in Israel. He was very influential in Israel. But he had an encounter with God. And he met Jesus. His family rejected him. His father rejected him. Everyone rejected him. They lost everything. And him and his wife were living in a tent down at the, at the, the sea. For several months they lived there and said, God, what? And God has now just rebuilt his life and he is really a voice in Israel for the Messiah, Jesus. But he lost it all. How many of us today are willing to lose it all? Did it all be gone tomorrow? And trust God, Lord, I will follow you with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind. And you know exactly what we have need of and you will get us through that's the examples that were that set here people that have followed God with the whole heart of their passion for the Lord and God met them God gave up or they gave up everything to follow the Lord their passion wasn't an end but an Motivation to follow God completely. Galatians 5.24 And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The passions and the desires of my flesh are no more. Lord, I want your will. So questions we must ask ourselves. Who or what has your heart today? Who or what has your heart? Where do I spend most of my free time? What do I think about most of the time? How do I spend my money? Do I compare myself, my home, and my family to others? Are we comparing ourselves? Are we looking at the world? Are we judging by the world? Are we saying thank you, Lord, for what we have? 
this life that we live in here is nothing compared to what eternity is going to be like. And so if we have nothing, if we live in a tent, children of Israel lived in tent for 40 years in the wilderness. They survived. But Lord, you will see us through whatever is before us. It's easy to get off track, but God is faithful to help us to get back on track. All we have to do is, Lord, help me get on track. Help me get my life in order. Help me get focused right. So the conclusion is being passionate for Christ means you take the time to be with him. Amen. You cannot build a relationship with anyone unless you spend time together. As a husband and wife, as a parent and child, any, any relationship we have in this life is because we've worked at building that relationship. And it's the same thing towards our Lord. We can't take God for, well, I accepted Jesus Christ 40 years ago, so that's good enough. I'm telling you, it's not. It has to be every day. Every day pressing into God, every day in his word, every day in prayer. Some days you miss, some days I miss, some days I get so busy and I go get frustrated. Sometimes I cuss and swear at something that's going off and I say, oh Lord, forgive me. Created me a clean heart. I don't want to do that kind of stuff. Sometimes the old man wants to crop up and get me off track. Oh, I got to put it back down again. But it's because of the focus, Lord, I want you to be the focus of my life and not the situations around me. Amen. And so if we find our heart growing cold towards God, take some time today to ask him to help you become enthusiastic about this relationship you have with him. And that's when we enter into worship. <coughs> we enter into this time of worship. Worship is this time that we we press into God. We just don't sing a song, but we express a love language towards God. And while we're, we're singing and worshiping Him, that it's from our heart and not just singing words on a screen. Let it be the prayer of your heart. Let it be prayer of com your compassion. And in this, uh, ask Him to help you make good choices at home, work, school, and keep him as your first treasure. As your first treasure. And if you do, your relationship with him will get stronger and stronger and stronger. Amen? All right, I've got to trade with Dan. If anybody is a techie and want to learn any techie stuff, we could always use backup techies. So we're going to enter a time of worship. So... Okay, this first song, he was talking about praising and worshiping. We want that praise to go through wherever we're walking. We want that sound of joy, that sound of triumph, Lord, to go before us, Lord. So join in. I mean, I want to fill your lungs. Let's, let's shout this out, okay? Amen. If we... <laughs> All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. All my life, all I know. 